Hi, welcome to Down From The Attic. Here we go again. Let's see what I can find. Well, at least that wasn't weird, but wow, talk about attic treasure. This is Curse of the Idol from 1990 by Milton Bradley. Just feast your eyes on this. I know I've fawned over artwork and packaging before, but just look at this thing. That's how you do box art. There's no other way to describe it. This is a masterpiece. It immediately reminds me of Temple of Doom. Let's just hope Molaram isn't after this. I can do without the whole heart ripping out stuff. It's got that old adventure serial look nailed down, almost like the fantastic art by Drew Shusen. He's the artist who painted the Star Wars, Blade Runner, Indiana Jones, Goonies, Back to the Future posters to name but a few. Defy danger to capture the bloodstone. Blood, danger, curses, this game knows how to lure in its audience. The quality of the theming and artwork doesn't end with the box. The board and the game pieces are phenomenal. Honestly, I can't think of a single board game from this era that paid this much detail to theming. This is a work of art. Thundering rapids tear through the dense jungle. Crumbling ruins and broken statues are strewn about the once glorious temple. I love the forced perspective of this fire pit. It really gives a sense of danger to the game. The board is full of wonderful details like snakes, pits of skeletons, secret staircases. It's marvellous. Assembling the game can take some time if you're not familiar with how all the components fit together, but I can get this done in about five minutes or so now. Yeah, this is such a gargantuan task that the assembly instructions take up the entirety of the inner box lid. There's four plastic corner pieces that hold the outer temple walls, two clips that slide under the rear wall, and another two clips to hold the inner temple walls. The frame for the wheels of death slide in and under the board, this also helps with keeping the board solid. The discs are fitted to the cogs, the cogs are fitted to the frame, and the plinth and golden sword are put in place. The inner temple door is also fitted to the small rear cog. The back to the idol is put in place and the bloodstone inserted. Giving the idol a shake and a good turning over helps the bloodstone fall into one of these six segments. This is important and will become clear when we start the game. The idol is carefully placed into the inner temple and we're done. Just take a second here to admire this. It really looks impressive. 
The graphics to the walls are completely different to one another, and different on the inside too. Creeping vines snake all over the outside, while ancient torches still burn on the inside. Talk about immersion. The artist was clearly proud of his work, in fact, he sneakily hid his name in the game. I see what you did there, Don Lawrence. You don't get past old Lukey. Looking up Don Lawrence, he was a fairly prolific and infamous comic artist from the UK. His style was oil paintings, and he worked on the long-running Storm comic. Amazing to think that MB hired on an artist like this to theme their game. I can only wish this sort of thing still happened today. The game pieces are similarly well made, the miniatures are nicely detailed, the idol feels robust and has this dull bronze gold finish to it. Looking at the manual, it has a great adventurer's journal slash comic book feel to it. Starting the game, you pick your favourite colour figure, everyone starts at the base camp, and the villain starts in front of the sword plinth. Ah yes, did I not mention this game as a villain? We'll come back to him shortly. Your objective is to obtain the golden sword and make your way into the inner temples via the wheels of death. Once in the temple, you have a 1 in 6 chance to correctly insert the sword into one of the slots on the idol. Guess wrong, and you go to the pit of bones. Guess right, however, and you'll free the bloodstone. Then, it's a race back to base camp, but all the other players are trying to steal it, and the glory from you. You roll a dice to determine how far to move, but you have the option of either moving your piece, or the villain. The villain has some interesting play mechanics to him. Firstly, he cannot leave the temple, nor can he enter the inner temple. This is a good thing, as someone would have the idea to move the villain into the inner temple and spoil the game for everyone else. Secondly, he acts as a dead end to any path he's on. Players cannot pass him and must find an alternate route round. Third, if the villain lands on another player, that player is cast into the Pit of Bones. There's two Pits of Bones, either side of the idol, and it's player choice which one to put the play piece in. The Pits of Bones don't require a specific dice roll to get out of, nor any turn loss, but it does take that player out of the action and away from the entrance to the inner temple. Additionally, if the villain lands on the player carrying either the Golden Sword or Bloodstone, they go to the player who moved the villain. A tremendous amount of strategy is added with the inclusion of the villain. You'll often need to think carefully about whether it's best to move your figure or the villain. Do you move closer to the temple entrance or move the villain towards your opponents? Do you block their path with him or move yourself closer to getting the sword or bloodstone? Throughout the course of the game, treasures will change hands constantly, whether through using the villain or landing on the treasure holder with your own game piece. With everyone out for themselves, it adds a frantic pace to the game I like to think of the pieces fist fighting over treasure, like Belloc and Indy fighting over the Ark of the Covenant. Now onto the most interesting mechanic of the game. The Wheels of Death. Dotted around the board are these cog symbols. You land on the cog, you give the sword plinth one whole turn clockwise, or turn enough to 180 the temple door. As you can see, the three large cogs have different paths on them, and you'll find that routes regularly open up and close to you. Again, you can be really quite vindictive and prevent your foes from getting close to the temple door. You can also use the cogs to swing yourself closer to the door, or swing the villain closer to your enemies. Some player managed to land on the temple door and rotate themselves into the inner temple? Rotate him out of there! There's a lot of strategy to this mechanic, and for the most part, it works well. Get into the inner temple with the sword. You then have to make a choice, which slot to put the sword into. Getting the guess wrong sends you to the pit of bones, the sword back to the plinth, and the race starts all over again, with all players knowing that was the wrong slot. He chose... poorly. I've played a few games where it's been the very last guess, and by that time you're more than relieved to see the bloodstone. So you have the bloodstone, you have to get out of the temple and back to the base camp to win. There's only one way into the inner temple, but there's three ways out. These trapdoors put you right near the pit of bones. You can opt to go through the wheels of death, but this can end up being a long process with paths constantly being blocked off to you by jealous and greedy rivals. Once you clear the temple, you're pretty much home free, as players can't use the villain as a second option to capture you in the stone. You made it back. You won. Fortune and glory are yours. With all the action elements and fantastic theming, you think I wouldn't have any complaints with this, right? Sadly, this game has got some pretty big flaws. Firstly, stealing treasures. It's far too easy to do this, and when you spend ages getting to the sword plinth or retrieving the bloodstone, you can feel a little cheated by this. Of course, that's all part of the game, but using the villain to get treasures can be really exploited, especially when it comes to the bloodstone. A player can have his character hanging around the temple entrance, and have the villain jump on the player with the bloodstone, the bloodstone then going to him. 
With that player being so far away from all the other players, there's absolutely no chance they'll catch him unless they get very lucky and roll a succession of sixes. Six means you roll again. A house rule we implement is when a player lands on another player, we play rock, paper, scissors to determine the winner of a duel. The duel winner keeps the treasure. You could also do this by having the player roll a four or higher, bringing it back down to 50-50 chance. Another house rule we implement is that when the bloodstone is free, Landing the villain on the player holding the bloodstone doesn't mean that the stone goes to that player. No, the villain's objective in the manual is to guard the stone for himself, so the bloodstone now goes to the sword stone in front of the idol. This does a lot to fix the end of the game. It ends far too quickly otherwise, and using this house rule, it kind of extends the objective of getting into the inner temple as seen in the first half of the game. As mentioned before, certain games have had the bloodstone drop on the final guest, and this can get really tedious, with everyone battling to get into the inner temple, stealing a sword off each other, sending each other to the pits of bones. Players seem to forget that letting other people get into the temple helps them. If they guess wrong, well, you know not to put the sword in that slot if you get there. If they guess right, well, they saved you a job. But a game where it can take six attempts to free an objective, it can feel long in the tooth. I've implemented a rule where you roll a dice to determine how many attempts you get at guessing which slot the bloodstone is in. This does wonders for speeding it along. The first time replaying this game, it took two hours. I'm not kidding. The Wheels of Death and Temple Door are a particular pain in the backside. Just when you think, yes, I'm in, some spiteful player will spin you out again. Seeing as it takes an exact number roll to land on the temple door place to get rotated inside in the first place, this can take forever. In fact, you'll be longing your own tune before the game ends. It's like the fireplace out of The Last Crusade. This is intolerable. A player will patiently sit hoping that it'll get rotated back in before their turn comes around. My thinking is, you've made it this far, you've got the golden sword, you've got to the temple door, you're rotated in, and that takes effort. Just move the player off the door and into the square inside the inner temple. This again does a lot to speed the game along and keep it fun. It's not fun being spun round and round that temple door like a rotisserie chicken. In conclusion, Curse the Hour remains a forgotten game of yesteryear. In doing my review, I researched the game and there's no other video review for it. None. This is the first. I think personally it deserves more recognition than it gets. There's absolutely no denying that this game looks terrific. There's some interesting gameplay and mechanics to it that really set it apart. As mentioned in my Labyrinth episode, I love games where you get to pull the rug out from underneath your opponent's feet, and this is one of them. There's backstabbing and strategy to this in spades. It's just sad that the rules that come with the game are so flawed. That's the real curse of Curse of the Idol. There's a really excellent game here if you're willing to think about adapting rules and instructions though. I've played this game with two, three and four players, and I found it massively affects the way the game plays. There's a lot more strategy involved with more players. Copies of this game can be found quite easily on eBay, and if you're up for an adventure, consider picking this one up. Fortune and glory can be yours. Thanks for watching. Talk to you again soon.